Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first meeting of the committee for 2019. Can I ask that all mobile devices are um, switched to silent? Can I begin by thanking everyone who submitted additional evidence ahead of stage two, um, particularly given the tight deadlines? Um, this morning, I'd like to welcome Malcolm Schaefer, Head of Practice and Policy at the Scottish Children's Reporters Administration. Um, Malcolm, can I invite you to give an opening statement of up to five minutes, please? Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the invite to come back. Um, let me begin by reiterating SCRA's support for this reform, and indeed for further reform. Um, we were members of, as you'll be aware, an uh, advisory group that was set up to do homework around preparing for this bill, and which was able to analyse all the data, look at all the issues that would affect um, the raising of the age of criminal responsibility, um, and which led to the bill that is before you. And first and foremost, our hope and desire is that this can be implemented as soon as possible so that we stop the criminalization of eight-year-olds. But we have, in common with other agencies, a passion, a genuine passion to go further. We believe that it is worth looking and we can aspire to raising either the age of criminal responsibility or the age of criminal prosecution to either 14 or 16. And a number of arguments have been raised by other um, groups, which you've, you'll have read as to why that should be the case. Our only caution is that we want to see this work. We want to see this work effectively. We want to give reassurance to both yourselves and the community that we can still deal with the difficult behavior that children can throw up. And it is the case that the work of the advisory group was entirely focused and the bill was written with the ages 8 to 11 in mind. And as you see from, I hope, from some of the evidence we've submitted, there are other issues which emerge the older you go. More offences, more complexity of offences, we have not analysed the data on that the way that we have for 8 to 11 year olds. We have not assessed whether there are other implications for legislation which need to be taken account of in um, raising age higher. We don't want to stop the ambition, far from it. We want to support it. We believe that certainly 14 and possibly 16 is achievable. But all we are asking for is a bit more time to do the work that we did for eight to 11 year olds to analyze, are there any extra issues that need to be built in for the legislation, for guidance, for resources, for services, to make this work in a way that will give reassurance to everyone that we can still deal with difficult behavior that's shown up by children but that we don't require a criminal justice system to do so. Let me stop there and invite any okay. questions. Thank you very much for that. Um, you mentioned there that obviously the priority is um, not criminalising 8 to 11 year olds and you want that to see that change as quickly as possible. I suppose a couple of questions that I would have would be how long was the work of the advisory group? What was the lead in to do all that analysis and assessment of data? And is there a risk um, in going straight to 14 and, and taking out the, the, that initial work that it delays things? Um, the, the first part of the work that was done was research undertaken within SCRA, analysing the um, 100 cases. Um, that was done in three months. Um, that would be an easier task than doing the same work which we believe needs to be done for 12 to 16. Um, and in particular, one difference is that we would need access to Crown Office records. 
because one of the core elements in this analysis would be analysing how jointly reported cases are dealt with and whether they have any implications because of their extra severity for things like grounds and powers. Um, so I, I don't recall how long the, um, the actual group took. As I say, the research took three months. I'd say the research on this would take longer because of the Crown Office dimension. So we're talking six months to a year. Um, and um, in terms of where, how long further that would take, um, again, it depends on your ambition. Unquestionably, it's easier to move to 14 than 16. 16 raises additional challenges, particularly in terms of extending the powers beyond 18. As, you know, if we're relying on the hearing system to deal with cases, then that its maximum age is 18, so we'd have to look further. So that would be added work. Um, but it can be done, and we are ready to go. Um, and certainly, I understand the government are very happy to support us doing further research into looking at the 12 to 15 year olds. Okay, thank you. Um, Mary Fee. Thank you, convener, and um, good morning. Um, I have a number of questions, but I wanted to start by asking you about the, the, the age in, in the bill as drafted, raising it to 12. Um, because the, the, the Commissioner for Human Rights in, in Strasbourg, in her, in her letter to um, the Minister and um, the committee, said that she was concerned that, that raising it to 12 gives insufficient guarantees for, forward, for a forward-looking um, system. And the Minister, in, in, in her letter to the Commissioner, has spoken about um, the wider, unique Scottish approach that we have and, and where the age of criminal responsibility sits um, w w within that. And I'm a bit concerned that there's almost an implication that because we have this unique system, we can somehow ignore obligations that come out of um, the United Nations. And I'd be interested, firstly, in your comment on that, and whether you think there are any other obligations because of our unique system that, that we can just ignore? I think in the past, we have felt comforted by the fact that it's been dealt with through the hearing system, unquestionably. Um, our position is unquestionably that we can go higher hmm. and that um, an important crucial part of the reform, which this bill touches on, but doesn't deal with completely, it's also dealt with by other reforms, is dealing with disclosure. Hmm. So that children who are dealt with through the hearing system do not end up with a record that taints them through their life. And that is one critical element. I've been a reporter since 1974, and ironically, it's since 1974 that laws have existed through the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act, which have required um, um, children to disclose, which have meant that they carry a criminal record mm. for appearances through hearings. And that is one core element of the reform, which is also attached to the Management of Offenders Bill, also attached to PVG reform, which um, will make a huge difference in Scotland in terms of what the hearing system is about, we're about rehabilitation. Mm. We're about children being given, not having what's happened to them at age of 10, 12, hanging with them all their life. We want to give a fresh start. Mm. Um, and that's why we believe that there's a potentially really exciting um, programme of reform that is around at the moment, which can make substantial differences. And coming back to your question, I think it is important that we give a clear message that we're not stopping at 12. Okay. And taking account of everything that, that you, you've just um, said, the decision to, to make it 12, was that the easiest option to go with? That is a very easy option. There's no question of it. You remember that in our research, we showed that actually there was only um, potentially two children a year who appeared at hearings for offence grounds. 
So I think that it is the easier nut to crack. No question of it. Um, and that's why we need to, time to look further at the other areas of reform um, in terms of raising the age higher. But can it be done? Yes, it can be. There's no question of it. Yeah. Um, for me, the only issue is um, making sure we've got it working properly. Okay. And the, the, the Centre for Youth and Community Justice, in their submission, said uh, that raising to 14 would have a minimal impact. Um, because in the last five years, no child of 12 or 13 has been prosecuted in the criminal court. Is, is that a view that you accept? I, I don't know, to be honest. What I do know is the figures that I've given you in terms of the um, number of children that were jointly reported to um, the Crown Office um, and the numbers that were detained were retained by the Crown Office. And I do know some of those cases and know that we are looking at particularly significant um, events and incidents. Um, so um, I will answer I don't know occasionally, I'm afraid, okay. potentially to some of your questions. And that's my whole point, mm -hmm. that we don't, we haven't analysed the data. I'm not as confident in all the data as I would be for the under-12s. Okay. And I'd like to be. Okay. Jump in briefly just on, on that. Um, when you, you talk about... Um, time, is there a risk that I, I think we'd all aspire to, to always do, do better for young people? But I suppose one of the concerns, and the, and the more you mention we need time to analyse, we need time to, to, to do the, the extra work, is that while we're taking that time, there are children under 12 who are, who are still being criminalised. Would your position be that to go to 12 first would be sensible because you've done the work on that and you understand it? I would hate there to be a delay in the implementation of the under-12s. Mm -hmm. That's core cool for me. Okay. Please, can we not introduce that this year? <laughs> that would be our starting position. Sure. OK, thank you. Sorry. Please, um, community justice, <coughs> in, in their submissions, suggested uh, moving to 12 now and raising it to 14 and perhaps 12 to 18 months um, to allow a, a transitionary period to get everything into place, to allow you to, to, to do the work that, that you've spoken about. What would organisations need to do to facilitate the move from 12 to 14, and how difficult would that be? I think there's two different issues. There's firstly what organisations might need to do, but secondly, there might be issues around legislation, whether there's additional legislation that might be required, and that's the bit I don't know the answer to. Um, the particular issues that I'd want to look at in closer detail are looking at the cases that have been jointly reported, looking at the cases that were retained by the fiscal, looking at the cases where the child was kept in custody, looking at the cases where we referred the child to a hearing on the fence grounds, and looking at the implications of those in terms of is there any change needed for the grounds of referral? Are there any changes needed for the powers of a hearing? Are there any changes needed for um, uh, the resources available? Um, are there any changes needed for victim information? Um, these are the sort of legislative issues we'd need to look at. In terms of the practice issues, um, I guess each agency would have to reflect on that. From our point of view, there would be a need to consider um, our drafting of alternative grounds. That would be the most crucial difference. Um, if we didn't have offence grounds, then we'd be using alternative grounds. We do that to an extent already. Um, and the other main issue in terms of our practice would be in terms of changing our victim information service um, to meet with the uh, criteria set out in the bill. Mm. When you speak about these things, and I understand that, that it's difficult to quantify what each of each of those things would, would look like, am I right in thinking that you have all the data there, it's just a case of gathering it? You have lots of information, but you just need to gather it? Or are you starting from a point where you have nothing? No, we've got a lot of data, you're quite right, and it's just a matter of gathering it. Mm -hmm. the, the data I don't have is obviously the data held by the Crown Office. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But everything else is there, and it's a matter of, of collating Absolutely. it and working with Absolutely. partner organisations. That's right. Yeah, OK. okay. Um, 
Can I come now to um, the, the, the costs of, of moving um, to um, 16? Because the, the, the submission says that the cost of, of raising it to 16 would be 400,000. But and I, and I want to unpick that slightly. Is that based that that's based on two thousand eight hundred children? Is that correct? It's a very very rough ballpark figure. Let me suggest because I haven't got the data to be able to match it in. I, I think it's in particular recognising that if we were raising it to that extent, um, we'd be dealing with the cases that are currently handled by the Crown, mm. which would include some significantly serious offences as they currently are, um, we would need the um, extra time of reporters in terms of potentially being able to draft grounds, prepare proofs and handle quite complex proofs on new grounds, which I'm sure the legal profession would ensure are properly tested. Mm. So um, that would be the significant extra um, demand upon the reporters' service. But, but that is very much an estimated figure. Very much so. And have you done any work to look at, <clears throat> if it was raised to 14, how much um, that cost would be? <clears throat> and then further, <coughs> excuse me, how much the cost would be from 14 to 16? No, we haven't split it up. Um, we, and that's where the information, because the extra cost would be the information that we get from Crown Office as the cases they're currently handling that we would now handle. Mm. So what I don't have is the level of understanding of what those cases are and what the implications are for our service. So those are the most critical ones to deep dive and mm. think about, well, if these were being handled by reporters within the hearing system, what would be the extra burden on us and um, how much extra resource would mm. that require? Mm. So you'll appreciate that I had very little time to Put in the yeah, cost but, but I suppose my concern would be that picking a figure of, of 400,000, which is a fairly significant figure, um, could perhaps um, lead you to believe that it's, it's too costly to do or, or it may be much, much more than that. And, and what you've said is it was an estimate. Absolutely. And you have nothing really to base that on. It's very much an estimate based on looking at the sort of figures that of jointly reported cases that are being dealt with at the moment. So quite right. It's something that we we would need to refine. Okay. I mean, and I'll just pause you there for a second. Oliver had a supplementary on that um, matter. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. There was two uh, just quick supplementaries, but I'll ask them together. Just one was when you're talking about serious offences, be able to just, I, I mean, I, I can probably guess what they are, but just for the record and for, for, for people uh, who are taking an interest in it, just what, what, what you know, those, when you're talking about serious offences, where you're sort of drawing that line. Um, and the second question was, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not convinced about necessarily changing the age, but I would imagine that if cases are moving from the Crown Office to yourself, then there'll be a saving, an equivalent saving or a, a saving of some sort uh, to the Crown Office if, if you're dealing with the case instead. Is, is that correct? In relation to the second point, yes, I would assume so, indeed. And in relation to the serious cases, then they, the cases that are jointly reported are covered in a circular which the Lord Advocate produces in terms of guidelines to the Chief Constable on what cases should be jointly reported. And they're the serious ones, so murder, which thankfully there are few, if any, of, um, rape, of which there are a few, um, Serious assault, willful fire raising, road traffic act offences over the age of 15. Um, those are examples of the type of offences that we're talking about. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to come in while we're while we're talking about um, serious offences. Um, obviously, if, if there wasn't going to be a criminal justice response to those serious offences, to <coughs> sexual offences or, or seriously violent offences, then um, the children's hearing system would presumably need more powers to ensure public safety. But what would you envisage those those would be? And would they need to extend beyond a child's 18th birthday if the age was to move to 14 or 16? In terms of the powers of the hearing, um, I think first and foremost, we have to agree on what the purpose of the hearing is. 
and that it is not a criminal justice forum. Mm -hmm. It's I, not I there for the retribution, yes, it's no. not there for punishment, uh -huh. it's there for treatment, rehabilitation, mm -hmm. it's there for dealing with the causes. Uh -huh. um, Malcolm, I'm just going to interrupt you briefly, if I may, because I absolutely would acknowledge that and accept it. Okay. However, I think that um, the public, our, our constituents, us as MSPs, absolutely. would want to ensure public safety. And if we're talking absolutely. about serious criminal offences, yeah. of course there's an element of, yeah. of rehabilitation for children. But, yeah. you know, that's that's yeah. what I'm, I'm asking. I mean, the hearing have the powers that a court have in relation to they can place the child in secure accommodation, for instance. OK. Um, they can impose... Um, powers of residential care, they can impose powers of supervision. Um, the added benefit of the hearing is that it keeps those measures under review at regular intervals to check that they're still appropriate, to check that the child still needs those. Um, so if you like, the protective measures that are available to a court are more or less available to the hearing. We don't have a power to fine, but that's hardly relevant for under 16s. We don't have a power to place children in um, in prisons, good, because our belief is that no child under 16 should be, but we can provide safety measures that where necessary, where a child is, is out of control, where perhaps we might need to look, and one part of the analysis, again, that we would like to look at is that small number of children, I think it's about 28 in all, who were detained in custody, having been charged with an offence, presumably because their behaviour was judged so significant that they, it was not felt safe to release them. Now, we might need to look at whether the powers um, that the hearing have to keep those children in care, keep the children looked after, um, are sufficient that we have at the moment um, because the current age of criminal responsibility bill only covers the initial 24 hours not beyond that <coughs> so that might be the most significant change that i could identify in terms of the hearing powers but other than that the powers are there i think the bigger issue for us all is actually um being able to have the argument that you don't require a criminal justice system to control behavior that we can take behaviour seriously, um, even through a welfare system. And indeed, the evidence of Edinburgh University, that I think you may have some familiarity with, would say that dealing it through the welfare system is more effective for children and young people than using the justice route. For all that, it does not appear immediately um, um, it doesn't have the same ring to it, if you like, especially for offend for victims of offences. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Oliver had another supplementary. Um, it, it was just to ask you, um, at, you know, at, at the moment for for serious offences that you deal with, uh, you know, how, how do you communicate that to to, to victims, um, and do you think that that would have to change if these more serious offence, even more serious offences, were, were 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 coming into the mix? Um, and the second thing I wanted to ask was, I mean, w w what happens, um, you know, if, 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 if someone's, uh, you know, I, it's, 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 I don't want to say found guilty, but you know, it's, it's been established that they that they, they have killed someone, taken someone else's life, you know, would they have a then the same rights to appeal? I mean, obviously, for the young person themselves, at the moment, if they go through the criminal justice system, you know, they, they, they've they've got perhaps. Uh, better legal rights uh, than, than they would if they went through the, the hearing system. Is that is that correct, or would that be something that would need to be looked at as well? Um, to take the second point first, n no. I mean, it, within the hearing system, they've got exactly the same rights of appeal um, and legal representation. If a child is um, at a hearing for a serious offence, which might m merit secure accommodation, then they'd be entitled to legal representation at the hearing they would be entitled to deny any grounds of referral. They would be entitled to appeal the decision of any hearing. Um, and indeed, they would have perhaps extra rights because they would have the right to ask for reviews of the supervision <coughs> order at any period after three months. 
so the hearing system builds in more rights and more flexibility for children and young people potentially than the court system. Um, now in relation to victims, the information that we currently give victims um, is in relation to um, whether we've received the referral, what decision the reporter has made, and what the decision the hearing has made. Um, that, on occasions, will be sufficient for the victims to know that at least somebody has looked at it and made the decision. On other occasions, it isn't enough, and, and they are frustrated because, firstly, they're looking for retribution, which we can't provide. Um, but secondly, we can't provide all the details behind why the decision has been taken because it's been based on all the personal background of the child and family. Um, so that can cause frustration. Now, in relation to the bill as it stands, um, the criteria for passing information for under 12s would be where there's physical violence, sexual violence, or behavior which is dangerous, threatening, or abusive, or where the conduct causes harm to other persons. So it's at quite a high level. And that high level may well be appropriate for any child under 12. Um, but it would mean that if we applied that same criteria for over 12s, then if you look at the information I've given you in terms of the nature of the offences that are reported to us and the number that are reported for dishonesty or vandalism, um, then the amount of times we'd be contacting victims if we're using those criteria would be very much reduced. So if your, if your car, for instance, was broken into by a child, that would not give us the grounds to contact you or tell you about our disposal. So it's one of the issues that I think needs looked at if we're raising the bar higher than 12 as to whether that criteria needs amendment. Okay, maybe you had your final Yes. <coughs> Thank you, Convener. The, the final area that I wanted to, to, to cover with you, um, and, and it's something that we, we've had a substantial amount of evidence about, both in our earlier evidence sessions, and again, it's been covered in the submissions that we've received for today's session, and that is around a young person's um, capacity to understand what they've done, understand the consequences of what they've done. Because a, a lot of the discussion around raising the age has been um, around young people absolutely know the difference between right and wrong. But there is a massive difference between knowing the difference between right and wrong and understanding the consequences of your actions. And we've had lots of evidence that suggests that young people can be in their early 20s before that part of their brain fully develops and they have a full understanding of the consequences of what they've done. And I'd be interested um, to, to hear your view on um, how a, a young person is, is assessed. I presume that social work assessments are done um, when any reports are being prepared. Um, but I wondered if there was a proper psychological assessment done of a young person, particularly a young person who commits a serious crime, to determine whether or not they have the capacity to understand what they've done. Because in an adult court, an adult can, can, can claim the defence of diminished responsibility. Now, I'm not sure. A, ch a child may be able to do that. I'm, I'm not sure. But it, it would seem sensible to me and would, would give us the ability to have almost a more nuanced approach to young people in crime if that proper assessment was done. Yes. Uh, I have absolutely every sympathy with that view. And the honest answer is no, I'm not, I don't believe that it's done sufficiently at present and that it can vary very much from individual to individual. Mm -hmm. It's a very much individualised mm -hmm. thing, and that's the unease with always going. A physical age is the easiest, mm -hmm. um, and it's very difficult, and it will take a lot of assessment in terms of the other grounds, but um, could more be done on that? Yes, mm -hmm. would be but, an honest but, answer. But even if, if the physical age was set, whether it's set at 14, 16 or higher, 
and we built in those psychological assessments, it would allow the criminal justice system to take a more welfare-based approach to young people, and, and it would save young people being stigmatised later in life. It would, it would require um, an extra specialised resource in terms of really drilling that child, but I think it is a resource that is needed and appropriate. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Alec Cohams. Thank you, convener. Good morning, Malcolm. Thank you for coming back, and thank you for your written evidence. I should remind members at the start of my register of interest of being past convener of Together, the Scottish Alliance for Children's Rights. Um, Malcolm, the written evidence we received in the second call for evidence around the issues of 14 and 16 um, was quite compelling. It was uh, very supportive of, uh, of the increase that you, you clearly support as well. The only note of caution in another a uh, piece of evidence that we received was from Social Work Scotland, which was very much along the lines that you've indicated about getting this right, um, making sure, whilst aspirationally going to a further uplift, um, making sure that the work is done and anticipating what that means. So numbers are important here because, you know, changing the goalposts around uh, how we deal with young people in certain contexts really matters. Um, and there's obviously a massive jump between looking at increase to 14 and looking at increase to 16. We're talking um, 835 young people who are referred on offence grounds who are between um, 11 and 13, I'm sorry, 12 and 13. And those who are um, 14 and 16, which lifts it to 2,800. Two, two um, can you, for, for our interest, it wasn't entirely clear what, um, when you said in your written evidence that we receive 835 referrals on offence grounds, not all of those make it to a children's panel. How many actually then go to a children's panel of that 835, roughly? You can talk roughly about 10%. About 10%. About 10%. So it's it, so 80-something. Something like that, that's, yes. That's fine. I mean, we are talking very small numbers yeah. in terms of that, small numbers in terms of prosecution, small numbers in terms of children kept in custody. But they're the critical cases, of course. and they're the ones upon which the legislation may succeed or fall on. And what we want to do is just make sure we've got them covered. So can I ask, what, what happens to those referred to the panel and who, who actually make it to a children's hearing? What happens to them now in terms of both disposal and victim information? Because I think that was an interesting point you made about grounds and what's communicated. So your, your 12 year old, for example, say, say we lift it to, um, if we're looking at just to 14 right now, if, um, the 12 year old you describe in your example vandalized the car, what would happen first in terms of disposal and then victim information as the law stands right now? In terms of disposal, it's a very, you know, we are not making decisions based on offences. We're, we're basing our decisions on the child and the background of the child. So it will vary completely according to, you know, the background of the child, um, the sort of support that the child has at home, the other risk issues that might be about how the child's getting on at school, bearing in mind the whole criteria is the need for compulsion. Um, so our disposal, if it comes to a hearing, might be about home supervision, it might be about um, um, residential care, it might be about living with another family. Um, the majority would be at home. Um, the, and as I say, what we would then do is communicate with the victim. We'd have told them when we had the referral, We'd have asked the victim, do you want further information? If they said yes, then we'd tell the victim if the child's coming to a hearing. And then we'd say, child placed on supervision or child placed in secure care. And can you tell me what would happen um, in, in those disposals that uh, for those young people who are currently referred on offence grounds who will get a, potentially a criminal record and some kind of disposal from mm. their interaction with the hearing, um, what would change, other than them not having a criminal record, what would change in terms of if they were no longer held criminally responsible? Would the victim information change or would the disposal change? What would be different? Um. The victim information would change if the criteria, as I explained earlier, according to the criteria that's in the bill. So, okay. you know, that would tighten it if, if, if we were kept there. In terms of the disposal, then otherwise it, it would remain the same. Um, I mean, I think there's an interesting issue which has been raised by 
a couple of agencies about, you know, if the implications of coming to a hearing can be significant, including secure accommodation, is it sufficient that we move to non-offence grounds which have a standard of proof on the balance of probabilities? Is that fair? Yeah. That's another issue that we didn't explore with eight to 11 year olds, which perhaps needs a bit more thought. Well, funnily enough, I was coming on to exactly that. Okay. Um, there may be, and I don't want to preempt the stage two proceedings, but there may be a, a majority view within this committee after the evidence we heard at stage one that in order to afford our hearing system greater flexibility, and indeed if we are having an influx of more serious cases, that a tool that we could give at the disposal of the children's hearings, and Children's Hearing Scotland in their written submission asked for this and said that it would be doable within the, the this legislation, to offer um, for a set defined uh, set of uh, offences um, a, a higher burden of proof so you have uh, beyond all reasonable doubt for crimes of violence or sexual nature etc um, and, and no longer just the balance of probabilities um, would you support that uh, that empowerment of the hearing system? I think at the very least it, it is worth looking at I'm not a fan of it of expanding grounds of referral. Um, when I started as a reporter, we had eight grounds of referral. We've now got 17. Yeah. And actually, a number of them are not used very frequently. But the so we can rush to adding grounds of referral, and I'm not convinced yet as to whether that's needed, although the data we can get from jointly reported cases may better inform us. But the issue of the standard of proof um, certainly bears further consideration, bearing in mind the implications of our actions for the child or young person, that it can lead to being placed in secure accommodation, for instance, uh, that hopefully we will deal with the disclosure issues so that that no longer becomes an issue, but as currently within the law, then there are disclosure implications as well. Because that was also a concern voiced by Social Work Scotland in terms of the, the work that needed to be done around lifting it still further was around that uh, the standard of proof. And obviously, if you've got a 13-year-old um, a who's accused of uh, a sexual crime, um, then arguably there's a children's rights imperative to apply the same sort of threshold that you would expect in a criminal court for them to, to have that case tested so that they have the that everyone around them has the confidence in, in the decision that that the panel comes to. Um, is that part of the work that you... I mean, so, for example, say that happened and we passed an amendment to the bill which in gave those uh, the panels that additional standard of proof that they could apply to a certain set of cases. Would that negate some of the work you would need to do in the, the hinterland of lifting it to 14 or 16? I would prefer to have done the work first before we came to that conclusion, right. to be honest. I think that's the more logical okay, way I of understand. doing it, um, to see if that is necessary. I mean, the clear difference is um, <coughs> that within the criminal justice system, we're talking about um, a child being criminalised, a child having a record. <laughs> now, if our reforms can do away with that, then the implications may be less. Um, but I think it is a debate that needs to be had um, unquestionably. And obviously it would be not for the hearing, but it would be for the court in hearing any proof arising out of a hearing to apply that different standard of proof. I understand. Yeah. Can I go back to numbers very briefly? Um, in terms of the 6% of cases that um, were retained of the 192 or 162 who were jointly referred to the Procurator Fiscal and the Children's Reporter, 6% um, were retained and arguably some may have been prosecuted or, or may not. But um, in that situation, when a, a child go, is prosecuted in adult criminal court, do they lose any access to the benefits that they could have received had they gone through the panel? Because I'm aware that you know one of the great things about our children's hearing system is not just the disposal, but the wraparound support that comes with it and the signposting, the, um, the referrals that, that can be made by uh, panel members to children to, to help their rehabilitation. Do those who then go through adult criminal court lose that benefit entirely? No, not necessarily. Firstly, a number of them may already be on supervision, ah. so there might be parallel proceedings.
but secondly, if the child is found guilty of any offence, um, then if the child is on supervision, there's a requirement on the court to ask for advice from a children's hearing before making disposal. And indeed, the court then can subsequently remit the case to a children's hearing for disposal. Um, and the court has the discretion to do so if the child is not on supervision. So there are links built in. They could be strengthened, but okay. they are there in terms of um, <coughs> ensuring that the hearing system has a voice. OK. Um, moving on to time, um, and you've suggested that you know that there could be a year, two years of, of work around the, the sort of... Um, the permutations of lifting it either to 14 or 16. Um, I think f from what we've heard from you, I think you, you've suggested it might be easier to get to 14 and, and that work because of the, the smaller numbers and and the less, perhaps um, less severe, severe crimes committed or offences committed, that that might be easier. But in terms of that timescale, I, I have full sympathy with what you say about not wanting to delay the reform for um, eight to 11 year olds, absolutely agree with that. In that context and, and legislation, this is a, a sweet spot in, in this legislative process. This is our opportunity to make changes which, which answer those concerns. So if we brought amendments at stage two or stage three, which phased in an implementation, which said that from, for example, um, the, the date of royal assent, that no um, children would be held criminally responsible up to the age of 12, but that in, say, April 2021, by there would be a second implementation date whereby which 14 or 16 would come in. Um, and we could also pass a moratorium saying that no child in that process would be uh, have a, a long-standing criminal record or, or would be dealt with in criminal courts. Um, would that answer your concerns and give you the time that you required? We're looking for a staged way of dealing with it. Um, I, I guess you, you're the ones who know the, the process better <laughs> than me. Um, my only issue would be that um, the second stage needs to have the flexibility to introduce any extra legislative requirements which the deep dive and the further work yeah. might identify are needed. Yeah. I understand. So that would be the only concern about... You know, I think the, the reason I ask that... Is, you kindly suggest we, we know how these processes work, not always, but, but we do our best. But in terms of um, the, the, the legislative machine that is the Scottish <clears throat> Parliament is quite clunky. It has been 80 years since we have looked at age of criminal responsibility in this country. And my, my deep anxiety is that once we have passed this bill in whatever form, it may be that the show moves on and we don't come back to this, despite the will of this committee and members on it, that, that just the, the confluence of events and things that overtake this parliament in terms of all the many things that it has to deal with mean that it might be some significant time. So it's about using this opportunity as best we can. And we, we know through pieces of legislation that you and I have both been involved in, for example, the Children Young People Bill, the Children's Hearing Bills, there are aspects of implementation which can take years, but when got right, work wonderfully, and, and the, they still remain in statute, whether that's the provision for independent advocacy in children's hearings, or whether that's the name person provisions of the Children and Young People uh, Act. The, there is flexibility to, to make those um, connections and draw those dots together in that implementation period. But sometimes I think it's incumbent on Parliament to throw the cap over the wall and say, this is where we need to get to. This is an international imperative to get to. Um, would you agree with that? I don't want to stop at 12. Yeah. I think we've been quite clear at that. Um, I want to make sure that the legislation works. I think I can leave it at that. Thank you. I guess I suppose the other thing that, that I would just want to add at that, my colleague made his, his sort of views on it very clear. I was struck by you saying that, that they want the work in terms of the analysis and the assessment to be done first and to be got right. You would... Absolutely. Yeah, OK. Absolutely. Did I have a further question from Gail Rose? Yeah, I just wanted to um, touch on the raising of the age of um, prosecution as well. If we do the criminal responsibility, will we do the prosecution? Do they go hand in hand? 
Well, there's different options for you. Um, one is to keep the offence ground within the hearing system, but to say, to raise the age of criminal prosecution to say 16 or 14, so that children cannot be dealt with in courts. That child, children can still be um, charged with offences, but um, cannot be dealt with through the criminal justice system, only through the hearing system. Um, I, I'm not necessarily arguing that, especially up to 14, but it is another option. If, in terms of a, a staged response, if in terms of public confidence, that could be an option. So would you say um, that if we, if we, could we do that now, go to 12, have the phased in to 14 as was mentioned, and then do the disclosure thing as well? Would that all work together? How would you see that happening? Um, again, it comes back to a greater understanding of the cases first and foremost. Sorry to keep reiterating that, but I think it is critical in terms of doing that. I think if there's any move to 16 being contemplated, then there's real work needed in thinking about the powers that would exist in respect of the child beyond the age of 18, whether it's raising the age of criminal prosecution or the age of criminal responsibility. That would be the major test for me. If you have a child of 15 years, 10 months, who's charged with rape and is dealt with through the hearing system, then our powers end at 18, and there's no links, nothing further beyond that. That's the bit that would need particular extra consideration if we were going up to 16. That's the major challenge of 16 for me. Okay. Right, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, I, I said I'd finish. I realise I've not entirely. Um, Malcolm, you've talked about extensively about the work that you think would be required to make it either of the two changes happen and we we understand that we we get that entirely and it's that's due diligence that's right that you should should raise it um i take it that's based on the resources that you have in the, the reporter right now in terms of the the capacity you have to deal with that well we've had some discussions with scottish government we understand that they'd be willing to support us in terms of giving us some extra resource to so, support that work so if you increase headcount with the, the right sort of academic expertise and Absolutely. research quality, you could actually truncate that period of time that it would take to, to get that information it, and do that deep dive? It, it depends on what we're looking at. It depends on whether we're looking at 14 or 16. Yeah, it depends know, on um, the view Crown Office would take about, yeah. um, about cooperating, which I'm sure they would, but yeah. getting access to their records would be a critical element. Understood. Thank you. Okay, well that um, brings our, our, our session to an end. Thank you very much, Malcolm Schaefer, for your, your evidence. Um, and the next committee meeting will be on Thursday the 17th of January, where we'll take further evidence on the Age of Criminal Responsibility Scotland Bill ahead of Stage 2. The committee <coughs> has already agreed to consider evidence in private, so I now move into private session and ask the public gallery to clear. <laughs>